It's now time for Global Insights, where we speak to experts from around the world on issues making headlines. Space scientists are still inspecting the South Korean rocket Nuri, which was supposed to lift off Thursday after a day's delay due to bad weather, but was uh, in indefinitely postponed due to a malfunctioning component. A sensor on the oxidizer tank appeared to fail during a final checkup before the launch. And while officials say that the launch window does remain open until next Thursday, if the problem is not identified and resolved, then Duri could stay put at the Nado Space Center until late autumn after the rainy season subsides. Still, the Duri has brought South Korea's space program on leaps and bounds over the years of its development, and we discuss its journey ahead with Kan song uh, research officer of the astronomy and space team at Kwacheon National Science Museum. We also connect with Wendy N. Whitman Cobb, professor of strategy and security studies at the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies. Very warm welcome to you both. And Director Kang, it's lovely to see you again. Um, why don't we start with you? Uh, the launch of the first homegrown space rocket for South Korea, Nuri. It was now delayed twice and now indefinitely, of course, first due to bad weather and now this technical glitch that scientists are still looking into. So what exactly happened there? Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Kang? Sorry, I think your audio is failing. Yeah. OK, uh, there we go. Right, it's All not right. just space rockets. You know, internet yeah. connections so, can also fail. But yes, um, please fill us in. Thank you. Sorry for that. The lunch day was initially slated for June 15th. The day before lunch, the lunch vehicle must stand on the lunch pad. However, due to the severe wind and rain at Gohong, where the lunch station is located, the lunch was postponed by one day to June 16th. It was dangerous to erect the lunch vehicle from the transporter, as well as to personnel who must climb up high to connect the umbilical wires because of the strong wind. So the launch vehicle departed from the assembly facility at 7.20 a.m. the day before yesterday, which is June 15th, and the weather condition got better. And arrived at the launch pad and is erected safely, then all of umbilical wires were connected. The operation appeared to be running smoothly until the level sensor in the oxidizer tank of the first stage of the launch vehicle was discovered to be malfunctioning at 2.05 p.m. at the same day. The level sensor in the oxidizer tank has a little buoy that indicates how full the oxidizer is. When she stood up and she, when she was lying down to move, the level sensor in the oxidizer tank had to show a different level. That is typical. However, the level sensor of oxidizer tank in the first stage it displays the same value, indicating that the level sensor of other components should have been examined. Right, so the, the levels basically remain static when it was supposed to be uh, moving as right. well. Uh, Dr. Kang, now how are the engineers dealing with the situation right now? And also, what's your projection for this uh, launch that hasn't happened yet? As I previously indicated, the Curry noticed an issue in the level sensor the day before yesterday and relocated from the launch pad to assemble facility. They spent the entire day yesterday looking for the source of the level sensor's signal irregularity. The results of the examination will be disclosed, I think, later today and it appears that they might be able to find the three significant possibilities. First, they will examine the terminal box displays all sensor signals from the oxidizer and fuel tanks. The terminal box could have either hardware or software problem. They will also examine numerous harnesses, commonly referred to as electrical wires, that conveys the signal from the sensors. Also, they will look for the level sensor itself may be defective. Although in this case, it needed to disassemble first and second stage of the Nuri and reassemble in order to replace a level sensor. We won't be able to know exact launch date until we see Kari's former statement, but it appears that getting the launch back on track within the launch window up to date by June 23rd may be difficult. 
because Nuri is assembled as ready-to-go mode, which means that Nuri has all the dangerous substances such as gunpowder and explosive devices in it. That will be a not an easy task. The launch date will be most likely be rescheduled and publicized at a later date due to a variety of variables such as the onset of the rainy season and typo. And now, Professor Whitman Cobb, bringing you into the conversation, what's your take on these uh, technical glitches with the oxidizer that postponed the launch of Nuri? I mean, is it something that uh, happens very often and do, is it easy to resolve? Technical glitches happen all the time, especially when you're testing new rockets and new space systems. Um, it's become sort of a common saying in the space industry that space is hard. Um, but it's absolutely true. Uh, it, this is a very difficult thing to do. I mean, you can look at uh, the United States and NASA and the problems they're having with the space launch system right now. Um, so this is a very experienced agency that is still experiencing a number of technical glitches. So I don't think it's uh, uncommon or unheard of uh, for these types of technical glitches to happen. Uh, obviously, we saw a weather delay earlier this week, which is also a very common thing that we run into with space launches. Um, so I think this is something to be expected, uh, particularly when you have a new, pro a new uh, rocket, a new project like Nuri. Um, so I think this is, it, it, it's a normal thing. I know it, it seems like sort of a big deal uh, because everybody wants to get it up and, and flying, uh, but you wanna make sure that you're doing the right thing and you're making sure that it works. Um, so I think it's absolutely reasonable for Carrie to be taking their time to think through this very carefully and work through the pro problem. Um, so I don't think it's anything to panic over. Uh, this happens all the time, absolutely normal. Um, it's just, you gotta find the problem, accept it, and find a way to fix it as quickly as you can. I'm Professor Whitman, Whitman Cobb. Now, if the launch, well, when the launch does happen, and um, if it does turn out to be a success, then what significance would it have then in terms of space technology? There's not a lot of countries in the world that do space launch. Um, there's a very few of them. It's only been very recently when private companies have been able to do this. So for South Korea to achieve this very remarkable uh, level, it says something. Uh, it says a lot about the technological progress and development of South Korea, as well as the economic development. But it also does it brings a certain level of international prestige. Uh, when we study, when we look at space policy around the world, we do see there's sort of a space club uh, for countries that have these types of capabilities. Uh, and so it, it really marks the entrance of South Korea into that very prestigious club. Um, it also is a, it's a very big thing in terms of local economic development and growing that homegrown uh, technological development. St larger strategic issues, um, it means that South Korea won't be dependent on other countries or private companies in order to reach space. Uh, and, and that's really important, um, I think, strategically, because if you're relying on somebody else, they could take that uh, ability away from you at any time. But if you have that ability right within your own country to launch whenever you want, whatever you want, that's a really big uh, thing to be able to say and be able to utilize for many different purposes. And same question to you, Director Kang. Uh, what significance would a successful Nuri launch uh, with dummies, uh, not dummy satellites, but uh, real satellites this time have on South Korea's space industry? Uh, even if the launch is a flop, the process is not completely worthless. The failure can teach you far more than most people believe because the team is the account for the buoyancy inside the third stage uh, up third stage oxidizer tank last time. Due to the excess buoyancy, the helium tank inside the oxidizer tank was detached and caused an oxidizer leak during the last launch, preventing the dummy satellite from the attaining the correct orbital speed. This procedure would not have been found without the first launch, and based on the first launch, uh, we learned that lesson. They charged the inside the structure of the, uh, they changed the inside the structure of the oxidizer tank for this launch to avoid the repeat of this issue. Of course, the second launch has glitched, could have unanticipated problems like this time, 
But I believe it was very fortunate that we were able to spot a flaw be uh, before the launch and get a second opportunity for the Nuri space rocket. And Professor Whitman Cobb, now many countries are keen on building their own uh, rocket launch system, of course, including South Korea. But are there any differences that distinguish South Korea's very own rocket? In terms of basic technology, all rockets right now utilize the same um, idea. It's liquid fueled rockets, um, sometimes with solid rocket boosters attached. Uh, Nuri is a three-stage rocket. Um, more modern rockets like SpaceX's Falcon 9 utilize a two-stage model. So in terms of larger technological differences, there, there really aren't many, um, but this does use three different stages in order to get the rocket to orbit. Um, so it allows you to use perhaps fewer engines, less powerful engines. Um, so on the Falcon 9 uh, from SpaceX, you have nine engines clustered at the bottom of the first stage, whereas uh, Nuri has far less than that. So in order to get to orbit, in order to reach the altitudes that you want to reach, you need a little bit extra power. Um, so I think this is a, a very good um, piece to start with. I know uh, Carrie wants to go ahead and, and work to expand the envelope, so to speak, uh, make this a more powerful rocket down the road and really enhance what they can do with it. Um, so I, I think it's an excellent start. It, it, it will get uh, North, uh, South Korea where they want to go um, and on the road to get there. And lastly, Professor Whitman Cobb, now what would be the next major task for uh, South Korea's well, space engineers in terms of its space program, if successful. And what have other of uh, the other six countries that successfully uh, launched their space rockets, what have they done since uh, their, uh, since their uh, performance, the performance of their rockets? For South Korea specifically, you know, the next steps once they get a successful Nuri launch is really going to be doing that again and again and again. You build up that experience, you build up the expertise, and you also demonstrate that your rocket is reliable. Um, that's a really big thing that you want to know that you, your system is good to go, that the chances of something going wrong are fairly low. You can't get rid of them altogether, but by launching numerous rockets over time, you can really show that that chance remains very low. Uh, other countries, you know, obviously a lot of the big countries like United States, Russia, and China go on to do uh, more expansive projects in terms of human spaceflight. But for most countries, that's really not the end goal. And it doesn't have to be either, particularly when you have a partner uh, country that you can work with, as South Korea often does with the United States. Uh, for many countries, uh, there's a part, a big part of this is economic development. Uh, if you show that you have a reliable product um, that is within market prices, uh, you can sell that, you can sell those services. And so that's what a lot of countries, including Japan and India, have done with their homegrown uh, launch capabilities. Uh, another part is being able to develop the satellites that fly on that. Um, so another next step, another place to take it is to be able to develop um, those satellites. I know South Korea has been looking at building out uh, sort of their own uh, GPS system uh, to aid the GPS system that's currently in space, but um, build those uh, uh, satellites that can help make that more accurate within the region. And so I think being able to go out and develop that technological expertise um, is a really big draw and will be a, an important driver uh, for, South, or for South Korea. A lot of these decisions about where you take this capability really has to do with what you ultimately want to get out of a space program in terms of the benefits. And I think for a country like South Korea, it's definitely economic and technological development. And Dr. Kang, with these bright prospects ahead, uh, what's next for Nuri um, if it launches successfully? Uh, the Nuri's launch is notable since it is first a homegrown space launch vehicle built entirely using our own technology. Only, uh, as, Dr., uh, as Professor Cobb says, only seven countries in the world, including the South Korea, have access to, access to this technology, and Korea has recently about to join them. The Nuri will be able to market the space launch vehicle after seven successful tests and utilize it to launch satellites from various countries across the world. Korean private companies that are naturally involved in this project, in this space project, improve their technologies 
and market will also grow. The next generation of homegrown space launch vehicles will be employed in lunar exploration, which is another of, of Korea's space mission goals. And it will eventually will be able to compete, compete with the world's leading space exploration technologies. Well, hopefully we'll see Nuri's launch um, going back on track perhaps next week, perhaps in the coming months. But when it does, hopefully we'll see some success and, in, and it will definitely have uh, spillover effects in the local economy and, and have big impacts uh, in the global space industry as well. So a lot to look forward to there. That was Dr. Kang Sung-ju, Research Officer of the Astronomy and Space Team at Hwacheon National Science Museum here in South Korea, and Wendy N. Whitman Cobb, a, a Professor of Strategy and Security Studies at the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies. Thank you both so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.